You probably already know that today's guest is a 12-time All-American swimmer who's the leading defender of women's sports. But do you know how she met her husband? What it's actually like behind the scenes of the Joe Rogan experience? What her workout regimen is or day in the life looks like? What about her response to appearing in that controversial calendar a few months ago? For the first time, she's really diving in. This interview is brought to you by conservative-owned Mimi Skincare, who just released their brand new non-toxic and fragrance-free skincare line, Mimi Clean. There's five new luxury skincare products without the harsh chemicals. Mimi created this line with input from me because this was something you guys said you were really looking for, an America-first, clean luxury skincare line, and they delivered. Shop Mimi at mimiskincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. Watch this interview on The Real Alex Clark YouTube channel and leave a five-star review if this is your favorite podcast. Please welcome best-selling author of Swimming Against the Current, Fighting for Common Sense in a World That's Lost Its Mind, Riley Gaines, to The Spillover. So one thing, Riley, about my podcast is I always like to start right out the gate with the hardest question (laughs) and maybe the most controversial So I did some searching on your Twitter. You know how you can search keywords? Oh, no. I searched for the word Taylor Swift. Do you know how (laughs) many tweets came up? This many. Zero. That's that's better than, I guess, in your case, some that came up that were negative, right? Well, um, I so here's the thing. I just want to know what you're hiding because how... Are you 24 and no tweets about Taylor? I am a diehard Swifty. So what is going on here, Riley? This is unacceptable. So oh my gosh, this is the most controversial question. I feel like your audience might like attack me. No, they hate Taylor and I love her. I'm her biggest okay. defender. Okay, well then maybe you'll just attack me. Yeah. I don't know. I really don't feel one way or another about her, to be totally honest with you. I think she definitely has it, that it factor, whatever it, it is. If I'm going to be honest, I don't think she's a phenomenal singer. Um, I'm I don't think I've ever been someone who's super into like the lyrical side. I know a lot of her fans are like, well, the lyrics, the lyrics. I'm like, yeah, it's true. Right. I don't know. I don't know. I just um, she has it. She does. She's an amazing performer. But so mm, you didn't go to the Ares tour in Nashville was not me. Oh, I was not that girly at wow. the Ares tour. See, I think no. if you would have gone, you would be convinced. You would be one And that's over. what everyone says. So I have a friend who is like, like, has all the vinyls, has all the things, all the like ordering them at midnight, knows like where and when and at what time Taylor Swift was born. Like, I'm talking like. She's like, me. She's you. And when I'm around her and she listens to, to Taylor Swift, like it actually that turns me off to Taylor Swift and more more than Taylor Swift turns me off to Taylor Swift. Who is your favorite artist? Like, that, who do you fangirl over? Like, if you met them, you would be, like, Ooh, freaking out. I'm a country girly. Okay. So, of course, growing up in Nashville, living in Nashville my whole life, super into, super into country music. Um, right now, I love Riley Green. Okay. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, he's amazing. Two, he's, he's conservative, isn't he? He is. Yeah. And he's real cute. Um, my husband is real cute. Riley Green is real cute. Is Riley Green the hall pass? <laughs> He's the hall pass. No, and my husband, we went to his concert and my husband is like, wait, Riley Green is really cute. I'm like, no, I know. I've been telling you. So, handsome guy, yeah, handsome man. No, for sure, for sure. You went on freaking Rogan this year. Congratulations. Crazy. I mean, it's wild. Like the opportunities that have been had, the people you get to meet, the impact that's been had, for merely, I mean, saying nothing profound. It's it's literally just saying that there are two sexes and you can't change your sex. And each sex is deserving of equal opportunity, privacy, and safety. But for saying that, I mean, having the opportunity, um, the experience of going on Joe Rogan, what, I mean, like 200 million subscribers. Oh my God. Absolutely insane. Um, but it was, like I said, phenomenal experience. Uh, the feedback that I got from an audience that is, Definitely different than than what I'm used to. I feel like so often I'm I'm almost preaching to the choir in a sense, and and his audience is is so broad. I I don't think there's one specific demographic that that he that I guess explicitly listens to him. There's moms, there's dads, there's older people, younger people, everything in between. And so I had so much great feedback, which was really special to me. 
um, to have people from all different walks of life, all different political backgrounds reaching out saying, hey, you know, what you've done is awesome. The stand that you've taken, I fully support it. You're so brave. You know, I have a daughter. Being able to kind of read the thousands and thousands of messages that rolled in after that was really powerful and inspiring to me. Okay, well, tell me about the whole experience. Like, it's you talk for so long. Is there bathroom breaks? Like, what was you like? Do you talk before it starts? Or is the first time you literally are face-to-face is when the cameras are rolling? Like, tell us about what it's like to go on Joe Rogan. I had literally no communication with him until I sat down in the chair. That was it. I had no idea what was going to be talked about. I mean, of course, I could could get a grasp, right, just based on my experience and my story and different things. Um, but I don't even think he fully understood, you know, me and my story. So it was kind of like we were both kind of walking into this scenario, um, not really knowing. So it was entirely conversational. No bathroom breaks. I mean, it was we talked for so long, but it didn't feel that long when you're actually in the chair. Do they tell you, do talking. the producers say like, hey, if you need to use the bathroom, just tell us we'll pause or what happens? No, they're just like, hey, sit and wow. start talking. <laughs> okay, so what was your take on it? Like, did you walk away from that interview feeling like I crushed it? Because I just, I would be in such a state of panic going on a show of that caliber, even though I do this for a living. Like, that's just such another level. So like, how nervous were you and how did you feel after? You know, I honestly wasn't that nervous because the topic that I spend my time and efforts speaking to, it really is common sense. Like, there's not a lot uh, of ways to really, I feel like, get me in a corner because it's so... It's so simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wasn't really nervous. Um, I definitely wanted to, it was kind of like a priority of mine going on the show to speak to my faith, um, knowing that Joe Rogan isn't someone who necessarily believes. But again, knowing how big his audience was, that was a priority of mine. Um, there was a point in the interview where he did start asking questions. Um, it, there was a little bit of theology brought up and like uh, he talked about the Bible, like, well, can we trust it? Because it's been translated so many times and in, in all these languages and things like that. And I thought that was interesting. I feel like, because I'm a Christian too, I feel like he is seeking. For sure. He just probably doesn't know 100%. that that's what he's doing. A hundred percent. Um, someone like him, again, this is kind of just speculating outside looking in, but who's so logical, who is so smart, who is so analytical. I think it's hard oftentimes to grasp a concept like faith, um, not being able to see God, right? A physical being, uh, our creator, we don't get to physically see him or tangibly touch him or hold him or anything like that. And so I feel like it's hard to grasp, but that's the very essence of what faith means. It's it's not seeing something, but still believing in it and knowing it to be true and just and good. Um, so I feel like, but to your point, I feel like he's coming around. Uh, he said in the interview, you know, maybe there is something to this whole Bible thing. You know, maybe it's not just a book of of these made up fairy tales because so much of what is in there is coming true. It's a prophecy. Yep. So many of these parables and stories and, and things that were told. And so to me, that was that was really incredible. I thought so too. I think he needs to read or watch The Case for Christ. Did you ever watch that movie? No, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, because I mean, that's a guy who was an atheist, I believe, or an agnostic. I can't remember. But um, he was a a journalist and was like, I'm going to prove that Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. And every corner he turned, he could not disprove Christ's resurrection and therefore realizing, you know, how true the Bible was. And it's a phenomenal movie for somebody who is on the edge of believing or is not a believer, I think. That's the book, that's the book and the movie I always recommend to people. Totally. Even C.S. Lewis, um, same thing, an atheist who almost in the same way found God. And even Jordan Peterson, again, another person who is obviously so philosophical and smart and again, analytical, can analyze someone like the best of them. But he's now uh, just coming around in the things that he says, uh, his tour that he's on now. Um, it's it's pretty amazing. To have witness. you done Peterson's show? I have. Gosh, that was kind of at the beginning of all this. And it was so funny when I did his show because he was actually, I think, in Portugal or Spain, something at the time. And so we did it on his time zone, which was 2 a.m. <gasps> my time. And so I was already so nervous to be analyzed by Jordan Peterson. I mean, <laughs> like, what a scenario to be in where he's like essentially like a therapist 
talking to me. I was like, this is so intimidating. But also at 2 a.m. No, when I was crazy. absolutely not awake. Uh, but again, he's someone who I admire so much and has just become someone I, I seek for advice now. He's he's wonderful. Wow, I love that. And what was interesting too is that at the time you recorded Rogan this year, you were talking, you were speculating that the Biden administration was going to walk back Title IX. Now they have. So, I mean, I guess for somebody who doesn't really understand Title IX, why is this important? Why do women especially need to care about this decision? Totally. Okay, so Title IX is the federal civil rights law that once prevented sex-based discrimination um, in educational programs that receive federal funding. So, of course, this applies to high schools um, that receive federal funding. This applies to colleges. This applies to even places like the YMCA, uh, again, uh, that receive this money from our government. Uh, it was implemented 52 years ago under President Nixon. Uh, and its original implementation, it was only 37 words. So a very, very brief piece of legislation. Uh, one word being activity, which ultimately allowed Title IX to be what it was most notable for. Title IX is very broad, but most notable for creating equal opportunities for men and women in sports, which is, of course, what I got to benefit from. Uh, being able to continue my academic and athletic career at the University of Kentucky. Uh, I was very fortunate to be able to swim all four years there. I had a wonderful, wonderful experience um, playing sports. It taught me how to be a leader. It taught me um, how to be resilient, how to set goals and, and work to achieve those goals. It gave me my best friends that will serve me for a lifetime. It gave me my husband. He swam at University of Kentucky. So I, I really couldn't speak enough about the benefits of being able to compete and ultimately be successful at the highest level. All of that to say, uh, what the Biden administration has done now is abolish Title IX and its original intent. Um, they have taken this 37-word piece of legislation and created a 1,577-page, almost half a million word rewrite, uh, changing it entirely. And what does it say now? Of course, when you go from 37 words to almost half a million words, there's a whole lot of fluff, as you can obviously tell. But the premise of what they've done is eliminate the word sex as a whole and equate it with with gender identity, meaning um, what the effects of this would look like would be men have full access to bathrooms, locker rooms, changing spaces. Men would be able to be housed in dorm rooms with women on college campuses. Wow, men could take dorms? Yeah, yeah. Men can take academic and athletic scholarships away from women uh, under this new rewrite. Of course, hate speech is deemed as discrimination uh, hate speech includes not using biologically correct pronouns. Uh, so if you, right, like a, a faculty member or a professor or a student or or if you, a 17-year-old girl who goes away to college, you're, you know, leaving your family for the first time and you're randomly housed with a male in your dorm room, of course, a male who identifies as a woman, uh, this is something that you feel uncomfortable uncomfortable with. And if you go to your administration and complain about this, under this new rewrite, you would be guilty and charged with sexual harassment <gasps> for even complaining about it, even for requesting a new roommate, for not using the biologically incorrect pronouns. Um, so again, the, the effects of this are, are very broad, but you ask why we should care about this uh, as women, but this is really something that, that everyone... <laughs> should care about this. This has an effect on men. Yeah, it does affect men. And and explain that because it's something like if, if they're accused of, of rape or something, they're basically toast. Yeah. So under um, the Trump administration, uh, in this Title IX, um, again, in its original, original implementation, if someone was accused of sexual harassment or, or some uh, sexual offense that would ultimately require sitting in front of a jury, uh, both the victim and the perpetrator had an opportunity to share their perspectives, go back and forth. But under this new rewrite, uh, they only listen to the victim's standpoint. Uh, the accused perpetrator doesn't have any rights. They don't have anything they can do. It is solely based on the victim's standpoint. Uh, so that's another implica implication of, of what this rewrite ultimately means. And again, how it's harmful to men 
oftentimes in this scenario. Uh, they're not able to defend their position. Is there anything we can do? I mean, like if, if, if we get a different president in the White House, I mean, are they able to Definitely. go back to the original? Definitely. They can reverse course because ultimately what the Biden administration has done, uh, I mean, it was an illegal administrative rewrite of Title IX. They didn't okay. go through Congress. Okay. Um, this was just um, an order, a decision that he, he put out. So I imagine, I'm, I'm hopeful that Congress will introduce a CRA or a Congressional Review Act to, to reverse course. Uh, we've seen many states now, uh, many attorney generals who are suing the Biden administration and the Department of Education for, for doing this because it ultimately violates their state law. So I think there's um, 21 states who are suing now, which is phenomenal news. We've, I've seen, we've seen Governor DeSantis, Governor Abbott, uh, Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Governor Pillen in Nebraska all say that we're just not going to comply with this in our state. OK, good. Issuing some sort of executive order there, which is, again, great news. You and I work in the conservative movement. So like all we see every day is this type of stuff. And, you know, we're very um, in the know on all this. And we see the breaking news as it's happening, you know, minute by minute and all that. Because it's it's just part of our jobs. We have to be in the know. You and I joked about how like right. anytime that we even do try to take a break, like, oh my gosh, wow, I've had eight hours off of Twitter. That's inevitably when Fox News calls. Riley, Alex, can you come on we and talk you. about this? That we, we don't, we're like, what? You have an hour and a half to prepare. Yep. So it's, it's, we really need to be in the know as much as possible. That being said, there are a lot of American voters who are not as plugged in, you know, obviously to scrolling Twitter every five seconds to see what's going on in breaking news. And so what I end up getting is a lot of comments or messages um, from people who are pretty low information voters who are like, this stuff is so, this is like a conservative conspiracy. There are not all of these men joining women's sports across the country. This was like an anomaly, what happened to Riley Gaines. This is few and far between. But you are are talking to people across the country that this is happening to. So my question is, would it shock people how prevalent it is men joining women's sports to compete? The general public has no idea the amount of girls who are losing out on opportunities, girls who are being exploited in locker rooms, girls who are being injured in their sports. Uh, and understandably so, because these aren't things that are that are being reported on in the same capacity of which they're happening. Uh, there's a website, it's called sheone.org, that has tracked just what we've been able to record thus far. Um, the amount of trophies and medals that have been taken from women by men. Uh, there are over 950 instances um, across, I think, 480-something competitions in over 28 different sports. It's happening all the time. Um, the messages that I receive daily, it's why I feel so passionately, honestly. Right. Because I'm, I'm not fighting for me. I'm done competing. Uh, you couldn't pay me to get back in a pool. I'd probably drown if I got back in a pool. Wait, you're you're avoiding pools. I sure am. You We're don't have a, a, you don't have a pool at your house. No, I'm on a pool strike. Why? I'm hydrophobic. I Are get you called serious? transphobic. No, I'm hydrophobic. Are you being serious <laughs> or joking? No, like it's. It's so funny. And any other swimmer watching, I know can relate because it's, it's again, it's a common thing that a lot of us face. But when you've swam six hours every single day, you know, of course, the four years you're in college. But I mean, I started swimming when I was four years old every single day, hours and hours in a cold pool, smelling like chlorine, your eyebrows are singed off. Like, it's just this like traumatic experience. <laughs> You love it. It's like a love hate, right? Like I loved my time competing, loved my friends, loved my team, loved it. But <laughs> you will never make me love getting in a cold pool at four thirty in the morning. Ew. So yeah, um, I'm I'm boycotting. Pools. Now you talk to speaking of like girls that are dealing with this across the country on your podcast. You've interviewed several, right? Tons. So so what is one of the most disturbing stories you've heard? Gosh, um, speaking to, I guess, what's gone on recently, at least relatively recently, uh, a couple girls reached out to me from West Virginia, actually. Uh, these are 13-year-old girls. They're in middle school. But they reached out to me and said, hey, Riley, uh, we're set to compete against a boy at our middle school track and field championships in shot put and discus, and we don't want to. They told me, like, it's... Um, you know, we don't want to have to fight for second place is what they said. They said, are we not worthy mm. of being called champions? Are we not worthy 
uh, of fighting for that top spot because we know we're going to lose to this boy. Which, and to their point, the boy won shot put by, by over three meters. Yeah. Beat all the girls. Anyway, so they're asking me, what do we do? You know, how can we protest this in a way that shows we're defending our rights to, to equal opportunity, but not in a hateful way? They're like, we don't hate the boy. Um, you know, we feel sorry for the boys, what they said. Again, wise beyond their, their years, these 13-year-old girls. And so I was talking with them, uh, asking them, okay, well, how would you feel about not competing, you know, getting in the circle, the ring, having your shot put and not throwing it when when you're told to. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'll do it. And it was so powerful because all five girls did it. It was really like the first time we had seen unity like this, not just a one off. I mean, these were five, five of the girls. It was a huge deal. And so ultimately, uh, their coach banned the girls mm -hmm. from future competitions for protesting in this way. Um, which they ended up suing and they they just won. There was a preliminary injunction, really? which um, was a, it's a huge deal. So couldn't be more proud of those girls. I think disturbing, you mentioned the word disturbing. Uh, I can think of several. One uh, is a girl by the name of Peyton McNabb, high school senior uh, in North Carolina playing volleyball. Uh, she's playing a game, of course, against another high school's girls team that has a boy posing as a girl playing which might I add, uh, a men's volleyball net is seven and a half inches higher than a women's net. It's almost as if they're acknowledging that biological advantages do in fact exist. But nonetheless, this was a boy. Um, he jumps up, he spikes the ball, it hits Peyton in the face. Immediately, she's knocked unconscious <gasps> to where she laid for multiple minutes before finally coming back around. This was actually in September of 2022 when this happened, almost two full years later. She's still partially paralyzed you on her kidding. right side. Uh, her memory is impaired. Her vision is impaired. She has to have special accommodations for testing at school because she can't retain information like she once could. She was supposed to play softball in college. That ruined her, not just her volleyball season. It ruined her volleyball career. It ruined her softball career. That would be the last game she would ever competitively play. It ruined her life. Yeah. She has it, weekly doctor appointments, even still. Did she did she win a lawsuit against him? I think she's in the process of figuring that out. Uh, the same girl, Peyton, and this was recent. She goes to a, a college in North Carolina now. A boy was in her bathroom, to which she felt unsafe. Uh, she got out her phone to record and asked him, what are you doing in the women's bathroom? You're not a woman. To which now her sorority has kicked her out of the sorority. The um, same girl? She's the endured girl. all this stuff? Yes, it's tragic. This is what girls face, and this is why so often girls stay quiet. Uh, is because the threats and the risk, like, they're very real. Uh, another example, just, just one more, I guess, to speak to the injury side of things. A girl playing field hockey in Massachusetts. There was a boy on the opposing team. Um, slaps a shot, hits her in the face. She lost all her teeth. Um, she had to undergo... Facial reconstruction surgery, jaw surgeries, dental surgeries to, to reconstruct her face. And that wouldn't have happened. And look, that's not to say that injuries don't and can't happen when it's only women playing against women. Of course. But the severity and the likelihood increase tenfold when you put even one man on the field or the court or what have you. What have you noticed or heard about the communities where this happens? Do the people finally wake up and say, okay, wow, this is super dangerous to have men competing against women? Or is it like a hush-hush, let's move on, let's not talk about it? It depends how it differs between somewhere like West Virginia, which is typically very conservative, um, all that jazz. Uh, the community rallied behind these girls. The attorney general um, he was one of the ones who helped these girls sue, Great, which was phenomenal. But in somewhere like Massachusetts, the media won't even touch it. They'll just sweep it under the rug. They have a, a Governor Healy, a female governor at that. Just really tragic. They don't want to address it. They don't want it to be known because they know it makes any reasonable, sensible, common sense person knows that that's intuitively 
men and women, I guess, intuitively are different, but but knows that that's wrong. Well, obviously, that's a great answer for, for people who are like, you know, why should it matter if a boy wants to play a girl's sport? We should let them join the team of the gender that they identify. And I know that in your new book that you dismantle that and many other arguments. But um, I mean, beyond what you're saying, the physical impairments, are there other reasons why we shouldn't allow them to do this? Of course, the unfair competition side, of course, the injury side. Um, again, mentioning just the the exploitation in locker rooms, that was a big thing in the sport of swimming, at least, and, and what we faced. And I think just understanding what we're doing when we're doing this, it's so much broader than just not being able to hold the trophy on the podium. The message that we're sending to young girls is, again, t- a message telling them they're not worthy. Mm. They're not worthy of standing atop the podium. Uh, their feelings, their identity, it's not valid. No, they exist solely to validate the feelings and the identity of a man, even if it means at the expense of their own. It's so funny because I I grew up in a conservative Christian home. I've been conservative my entire life. I was so excited to vote um, when I turned 18. And always I scoffed at being asked, are you a feminist? I was like, absolutely not. And then now it's almost like I hesitate because I'm so angry about this. I've, I'm I'm still not a feminist. I wouldn't identify as a feminist. But I am the most feminist, I guess, when it comes to this subject. For sure. It is truly evil. And it is true inequality for women putting us in these situations against men. And I feel like that is you know, a true inequality. Whereas traditionally feminism, it was like, you know, the wage gap, which is a myth and all these other things that are just BS. Right. Which is, it's almost comical, right? If you think about the, the original feminist movement, people who have claimed to be champions for women, um, throughout the history of time, these are the same people now who are actively undermining everything they once fought for. I don't understand how within six years we go from me too to you are not allowed to say anything if a man is, you know, ogling you in your sorority watching you come out of the shower. It was really cool. This past semester, I um, spoke on 25 different college campuses over the course of like eight weeks, which is absolutely crazy. Oh my gosh. But recently, I went to SUNY Cortland, which is of course in New York, and I got there a little early to campus. And so I went to one of the the restrooms on campus in one of the campus buildings, of course, sat down on the toilet and I'm looking at the stall in front of me. And I was appalled to look at this poster that was looking back at me. And this poster, reading it word for word, it says, do you feel like someone is using the wrong bathroom? Don't stare at them. Don't challenge them. Don't insult them. Don't purposefully make them feel uncomfortable. (laughs) Do respect their privacy. Do respect their identity and do carry on with your day. But we're chopped liver. But we're chopped liver. But if we're uncomfortable, don't say anything. They can't be made uncomfortable. No. And the translation of this is basically like, you know, ignore the threat of men, ladies. Abandon your instincts that something feels off. Don't listen to your gut or to what your eyes or ears are telling you. Uh, loosen your boundaries, stay quiet, and take your pants off anyways. And so I was, my husband was was with me, and so I said, I, of course, walked out of the bathroom. I said, go check the men's bathroom and see if they have this in the men's restroom. Yeah. No. Of course not. Of course they don't. But all of that to say, we have gone so far from the Me Too movement um, where now we're telling girls to to allow this to happen or else, or else they're the problem. They're the bigots if they don't. They need re-educational services or, or counseling or some other psychological services if they feel uncomfortable with the man in the bathroom. So with all this work that you've put in, the dismantling of Title IX, does it make you feel discouraged? I think it's hard not to. Uh, admittedly, when you see so much of the negative going on, you that's what our media it pushes out constantly is a lot of these grim, chilling stories. But I will say I feel more hopeful right now than I felt in the past two years that I've I've ultimately kind of been pursuing this fight. Why? I mean, the tide is just turning. It's very obvious in the way that people are talking about the issue now. I think for so long, including myself, right? Like I I really tried to tread. Um, to to walk on thin ice. I was walking on eggshells. You know, I didn't want to r- disrespect anyone. I didn't want to be hurtful, hurt anyone's feelings. And I still don't want to do those things. I do. 
<laughs> we love a, uh, yeah, no. Well, honestly, like I realize now that it's, it's not disrespectful to use pronouns that are biologically correct. That's not what disrespect is. No, that's actually love. Mm -hmm. That's what compassion is. We hear that word compassion all the time, but like, make no mistake, it's not compassionate to ask a young girl to undress in front of a man. Right. That's not what compassion is. And it's not inclusive to ask us to smile and step aside and allow these men onto our podiums. No, that's not inclusion. That is exclusion. And it's exclusive to the very female athletes who Title IX in the women's sporting category was created to celebrate and protect. But anyways, I think more people, more parents, more female athletes, more coaches, more medical professionals, more spiritual leaders, even so it seems, are taking a stand, um, being more bold, being more firm and unapologetic. We've now seen, as we've said, these states who are, who are standing up. That wouldn't have happened two years ago, even the way our media is talking about it. Uh, whether it's Fox News or other conservative outlets, uh, for so long, they did all the pronoun stuff. They, you know, would would kind of adhere in that way. But we're getting further and further from that, which I think is is crucial. You know, we need transparency. Mm -hmm. We need language that is clear when talking about this subject or any subject for that matter. So I feel hopeful, not just this, but if you look at, um, you know, everything that, that's gone on in the Middle East the past couple months and, um, you know, the past few months, we've seen this counter revolution on college campuses when, when, of course, school was still in session being had. That gave me hope almost in a weird sense because people, young people at that were pushing back. We have seen the conservative presidential nominee up by double digits in the polls. These are all great signs that people are acknowledging, again, everyday common sense people who maybe even would have considered themselves apolitical or non-political before, they're acknowledging that the pendulum has swung so far one way and it's only due time that it restores. And I mean, truth and sanity, they always do prevail. It's just kind of like a matter of how long do we have to endure this? How many girls do we have to let be injured in their sports? Or, or how many children do we have to let medically transition, chemically and surgically castrating themselves before this matters before it's a necessary and worthwhile fight to be fighting. Most of my audience has heard your story and they're familiar with you um, because most of them are conservative. But there are some people, I get told that a lot because, I mean, I don't have a super political podcast. I mean, I'm not um, doing like hardcore political topics and things typically. So I do have some people that are kind of apolitical, even some people that say I would identify as a classical liberal, but I really like your lifestyle and health and wellness content and things like that. So for those people who haven't heard your story, what is the Sparks Notes version of what happened to you? Well, one, I just want to say, I think your podcast and, and what you do, the platform you've built is so unique and beautiful in the way that you're able to appeal to, to really so many. So I give you like so much credit and props for that. It's really admirable. Very, very brief overview. Uh, as I said, was a, a swimmer my whole life, was very fortunate to go to University of Kentucky where I accomplished some incredible things, things that I'll forever be proud of. Uh, 12-time All-American, five-time SEC champion, uh, actually the SEC record holder still in the 200 butterfly, making me one of the fastest Americans of all time, two-time Olympic trial qualifier. I mean, the list goes on. But again, all of that to say, lifelong journey. Flash forward, uh, my senior year in college, uh, I was set to compete at our national championships, which is the pinnacle of our sport. Uh, comparatively, actually, it's faster than the Olympics because of how deep the U.S.'s talent is um, compared to other countries. We, we have so many incredible, talented swimmers here. And so, again, the meet you work all year, really all your life for, set to compete and ultimately had a goal of winning a national title, which would mean becoming the fastest woman in the country in my respective event. But about three weeks before this national championships, we found out that a swimmer by the name of Leah Thomas, who is formerly Will Thomas, who swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania um, before deciding to switch to the women's team, would be allowed to compete against us as women. And there was nothing we could do. No questions we could ask, no concerns we could raise. We were told we had to accept this with a smile on our face. And so, of course, 
Uh, to literally no one's surprise, Thomas swam to a national title that first day, again, beating out Olympians, beating out American record holders. Uh, these aren't scrubs. Um, de demolishing them at that by body lengths. Uh, the second day, he and I raced in the 200 freestyle, which ultimately resulted in a tie, uh, meaning we went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second, which is really rare, right? Uh, racing for a minute and 40-ish seconds and not even one one hundredth separated us, which uh, you can't tell me that's not divine intervention. But anyways, we get out of the water. We go behind the awards podium where, of course, you know, the top eight are, are marched out. You're named an All-American. You stand on the podium. All the fans, which are really just all the parents in the, the stands, they clap. And so we go back there. And the NCAA official looks at both Thomas and myself, uh, Thomas, who was towering over me at six foot four. Uh, the official says, great job, you two, but you tied. And we only have one trophy, so we're going to give the trophy to Leah. Sorry, Riley, you don't get one. What were you thinking in that moment? I mean, I had a lot of thoughts. Uh, I was, Did course, you want to cry? It was more so at this point, having just competed, like my heart rate was still so high and my adrenaline was still pumping. And so it was more like a feeling of betrayal, of course. It was feelings of frustration. It was feelings of confusion, honestly. Like, what do you mean? you're going to give the trophy to the man in the women's 200 freestyle. You know, what's the rationale for this? Because as I understand it, this is everything that Title IX was passed to prevent from happening. Ask the dreaded question of why, to which he didn't know how to respond to this. Uh, they didn't give him a script of what to say when someone asked why. But ultimately... Um, after some different back and forth, he came up with different excuses at first before realizing he was backed into a corner and there really was no justification. Uh, I appreciate his honesty. And he looked at me with with a sad face. OK, like he didn't even believe it was very obvious. He didn't even believe what he was about to say. But he said, Riley, I'm so sorry. Uh, but we have been advised as an organization that when photos are being taken, it's crucial that the trophy's in Leah's hands. Uh, you could pose with this one, but you have to give yours back. Leah takes the trophy home. You go home empty-handed. End of story. Who makes those decisions? We were told Leah has to hold the trophy. I have been trying to get to the bottom of, of this for so long. And every single person, including the president of the NCAA, at the time it was Mark Emmert, who publicly released a statement saying he unequivocally supported his decision to allow uh, Leah to swim with the women because he claims it was based in evolving science. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know science evolved in that manner. But I saw President Mark Emmert at uh, their big conference where they were announcing NCAA Woman of the Year, the most prestigious honor for collegiate female athletes, to which I was nominated for. Mm. I was the lone, each university gets to nominate one female athlete among all of their sports teams, all of all of their different teams on campuses. They get to pick one, someone who embodies of course, athletic achievement, but but academic success, um, someone who is very present and involved in, in the community, all things that admittedly I had done very well uh, during my time in college. And so I was University of Kentucky's nominee. But NCAA Woman of the Year was not exclusive to just women because Leah Thomas was University of Pennsylvania's nominee. So I go to this conference and I see President Emmert Having known the statement he had released publicly, saying he supported this wholeheartedly, he comes up to me and says, uh, keep fighting. You keep pushing, Riley. Oh, my gosh. The audacity. As if he's not the one I'm fighting, right? And what did so, you say? Um, I would have well, flipped in the bird. Well, I wasn't too far off. <laughs> but it goes to show, like, that's, that's the tippy top of the NCAA, and he even still says his hands are tied. Who is tying your hands? Right, that's what I don't Who understand. Who is tying them? This is, is like, it, it's like a dateline mystery. For sure. We need to get like the board and like <laughs> the tacks and the, the thumbtacks the and the strings and like, but honestly, and so I, it's something I think about all the time, you know, you know, I, I think there's truth to kind of all of these different things, but is this a movement driven solely by fear? Is it a movement driven by by money? Are these people scared? that they were going to lose federal funding? Are they scared of the lawsuits? You know, who or what, for that matter, 
is driving this. Yeah, like have any sports organizations on the national level tried to walk back these rules at all? Definitely. There have been some, at least in, in some ways, have tried. So, for example, after all of this happened in swimming, uh, FINA, which is the the na- international governing body of aquatic sports, they ultimately ruled that Thomas would not be able to compete in the Olympics. Uh, they said, hey, if you've gone through puberty, you can't compete in women's sports. The caveat there is if you've transitioned by the age of 12, right. then you can, which I think is 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 criminal. But anyways, it was it was the first really governing body to prioritize fairness over inclusion. Uh, Thomas is now suing World Aquatics and FINA to, to, I guess, potentially get an Olympic spot on the women's team. Now, I don't know what he's doing now, to be honest with you. I think he's in law school, which like, of course, he's in law school. What does he think about you? Surely in the circles that you're in, you've heard things that he said about you. I honestly, uh, there has been no communication, no form of contact, no nothing like that. I've reached out several times. I would love nothing more than to have a conversation, than to be able to express our side. And when I say our, I mean the the overwhelming uh, majority of those female athletes, those swimmers on that pool deck. I would love to be able to express this in a manner that is, again, embracing civil discourse, encouraging this kind of open dialogue but there's been none of that. I mean, I imagine he doesn't like me yeah, well, very much, but I'm I don't sure. know. What were the hours like leading up to the moment you knew that you were going to publicly speak out about this? It was hard because honestly, I believed everything that I had been told up until this point. I'd had to go to sensitivity training to learn how to use pronouns, where my school brought in an outside professional, whatever that means, who, who literally sat us down. It was like an interview setting, like a mock interview setting where she would ask us questions. We had to respond to her to her standard. If we didn't, we had to re-go through the training. Uh, I'd been told by my university, you know, you'll never get a job if you speak up about this. Uh, your employer is going to look you up. They're going to see that you're a transphobe. Uh, you're never going to get into grad school. And Riley, you know, you're set to be a dentist. You will never get into dental school. If you speak out this, speak out about this, they told me you'll lose your friends, you'll lose your scholarship. Uh, oh yeah, Riley. And speaking of that scholarship, remember you signed that, mm. and when you signed that, you gave away your rights to speak in your own personal capacity because you represent us. Remember whose name is across your chest and across your cap because it's not yours, it's ours. And understand, we have already taken your stance for you, is what they said. And I believed these things. I believed that I would never get a job. I believed that I was basically. Um, creating this environment where I was going to be a social outcast from my friends, from from family members, losing opportunities. But let me be so clear, none of that has happened. There was so much, of course, there was external pressure, but I think I put so much internal mm-hmm. pressure on myself to be what I thought was politically correct. Um, but I have, again, none of that's true. I haven't lost any friends. Not to say I don't have friends who disagree with me. I do. But my friends know me. They know my heart. They know the stand that I have taken isn't hateful. Mm -hmm. It's not a stand that's really standing against anything. I'm standing for something. And what I'm standing for is fairness, for safety, for privacy, for for equal opportunity, for for women. It's a very pro-woman stance. I was in dental school after college before ultimately kind of putting a, a pause on that. And when I approached the school and told them, hey, you know, I was very vague because I was nervous again. So I was like, hey, something in my personal life has come up. I'm going to have to put a halt on school right now. And they said, Riley, uh, we know who you are. We know what you do. And they said, we love what you do. Awesome. They said, they're a dentist or a dime a dozen. But what you're doing, what you're fighting for is crucial. It's urgent, they said. So they wow. said, we will hold your spot. We will hold your your deposit, your application, all the things Uh, For whenever you want to come back, you have a spot here. So that was a question I had was, obviously, the work you're doing is important, and I know that you know that. But I was wondering if there was a part of you that resents Leah because all of this has derailed what you thought was going to be your life. And even though you're, you're in a great position now, it's like still part of your dreams had to shift because of him. All of my dreams really had to shift. Uh, this is never something that I wanted to do. It's honestly like there is joy in it 
it's it's certainly um, you get a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and knowing that you're you're making real impact. And I certainly don't take that for granted. But even still, this isn't a fight that I want to be fighting. If all of this was was fixed and cured and, and there was a solution tomorrow to where no girl would have to go through, no person would have to go through what me and my teammates and my competitors did, I would happily go back to dental school. So so this has really uprooted everything. Is there resentment? Look, I have no animosity towards him. I really don't. I I could care less, honestly. I do think he's a narcissist. I do think he displayed an utter disregard for us, for our feelings. There's no doubt about that. So so I certainly have a problem with that. But ultimately, he was following the rules. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to see pictures of yourself standing next to him, smiling on the podium? It's so funny you say that because in that moment on the podium, like I'll kind of explain my like what's going through my head here because it was it was a whirlwind, right? I'd already decided actually. That's kind of funny, and no one really knows this, but I had already decided. I talked to my coaches and my family before the race, and I told them, you know, would you support me if I didn't compete? And everyone, my coaches were wonderful. My um, family, of course, was like, Riley, we support you no matter what you do. So yes, if you don't want to compete, then don't. And so it was something I I kind of tossed back and forth. You know, do I do this? Do I not do this? And I decided, you know, this was, this capped off an 18 year career for me. This was my last meet ever. I didn't want to not compete. I worked hard to be here. I shouldn't have to not compete. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to compete but I'm not going to get on the podium. Mm. That's going to be my form of, of protest in a way uh, of showing that, that I'm not okay with this. And so uh, that's what I'd already set. Uh, my coaches knew it. My family knew it. I'd even already told the officials at this point that that's what I was going to do. So it was very clear. I wasn't trying to, to pull this stunt or anything like that. Um, but then we tied. And so it was kind of like, oh my gosh, if I don't, even, if I don't get on the podium, there's not even an empty spot. At this point, there is no form of protest because there's no empty, visible space showing there's someone who's not okay with this. And so I'm thinking to myself in these brief moments, do I get on there? Uh, Do I, is this almost something that that's, that is like this photo op to highlight how this, again, six foot four man is towering over me with his broad shoulders, his big hands, his lanky limbs, um, his Adam's apple. Like maybe this is a good opportunity for kind of like a a photo op comparison, highlighting the very real physical obvious differences that we have. And so I decided I would get on the podium. And so I'm on the podium. I'm, I'm smiling. I'm clapping. I'm applauding. And it hit me. I remember distinctly. It hit me when I'm standing on that podium, cheering, clapping. It was like this realization of what in the world am I cheering for? No, I never supported it. No, I never agreed with it, but I was still going along with it to a degree. And it hit me. It was like, I'm cheering for our own demise, our own erasure. And it was in that moment on that podium when, I mean, up until this point, honestly, I just expected someone else to say something. I thought surely a coach would. I thought surely a parent would. Someone within the NCAA, someone with political power, some other swimmer, uh, someone who was supposed to be protecting us would protect us. But it was in that moment on that podium when it hit me, how in the world could we expect someone else to stand up for us as women, as female athletes, if we weren't even willing to stand up for ourselves? So that was kind of like, I guess, the backstory. Again, that that kind of first defining moment in this advocacy activism role um, that now takes up all my time. Caitlyn Jenner is a trans woman, an athlete um, who has changed positions on the men and women's sports issue, I think a few times throughout the years. And Caitlyn has even accepted an award for Glamour Magazine's Woman of the Year. Now, to some conservatives, they're like, okay, I totally agree that Caitlyn Jenner is an athlete who's saying, even as a trans person, I don't like, you know, young people having to endure being on a same sports team with someone of the opposite sex. But then there's other conservatives who are like, no, I don't care that that Caitlyn is the correct stance on that. We shouldn't be supporting Caitlyn at all. I mean, you're friendly with Caitlyn. How do you respond to those criticisms? Here's what I think. I think I think Caitlin's perspective on this issue is is valuable, right? In the way that this is this is someone who knows what it takes to be an elite athlete. He was, I mean, the world's greatest athlete at a point. So he he certainly understands from from that side. 
But this is also someone who has struggled with the idea, the concept of, of gender dysphoria, right? And so I, I think it's valuable in that way, uh, someone who can consider both viewpoints. Caitlin has become a, a great friend of mine, someone who has been at the forefront of this issue, I think specifically because of his perspective on things. Here's what I think, though. I won't call Caitlin she. I can call Caitlin Caitlin, uh, right? People can legally change their names, but I'm not I'm not doing the whole she, and I've said this, and he said, look, Riley, I'm fine with that. I don't do this to be affirmed by other people. I do this for me. Mm. And I can, I have, you know, I, I can understand that. I think, you know, we make our allies where we can. We have so much divisiveness going on in our society already. Why further alienate someone who agrees? No, we don't have to agree on every issue, right? I, I even think of someone like Martina Navratilova, who a tennis legend. Uh, she's done more for the lesbian community than probably anyone on this this planet, honestly. We don't agree on anything virtually, uh, but we agree on this topic. Mm -hmm. She has said, look, I know no one would know my name if it weren't for women's sports, if I had to compete against boys. And so we stand together on this. Well, you know who Caitlin is friends with is comedian Tim Dillon. <laughs> who I'm obsessed with. And I know that he's gone to dinner parties at Caitlin's house and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, you need to use that relationship to get to know Tim and go on Tim's show. And then I'll invite you. <laughs> and then invite me. Yeah, because yes. I'm like, I'm the, uh, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with Tim and I'm obsessed with Theo Vaughn. So oh, yeah. and Theo's so here. Funny. So I mean, yeah, you got you to gotta get invited to one of those Christmas parties, Riley. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working. <laughs> on it and you'll you'll be my plus one okay good yeah hopefully your husband will mind <laughs> um so yeah speaking of having a husband with all the work that you're doing and the traveling it's like how often are you even home gosh i think um in the past probably three months i've been home a total with this being one of them probably 10 days it's insane the amount of traveling that i've been doing and does your husband work on his own too? So he's he, off or what? He works in construction. So he has his own um, business. He does pools and, and and concrete and outdoor living and houses and all the things. And so that's interesting. Did you see how Maine uh, just implemented some bill about getting more women in construction? I did. Did you talk to your husband about that? I, I didn't, <laughs> but I know I know what he would say. A lot of people probably don't realize that you've been married for two years yeah. now. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Two years. And you mentioned that you met your husband. He was also a swimmer at UK. Yes. And so he is actually an immigrant. Uh, he is from England. He lived what is in, going on with these British men taking up the conservative women? You, Candace Owens? I know it. I know it. He's a cute one, too. But it's so funny because, well, he lived in England for a while, lived in Dubai for a while, seven, eight years, lived in Malta, which is like a small little island off of Italy for a while, uh, came over to the States in 2018 for college. That's when we met. And so he was there. You all were dating while all the Leah Thomas stuff was going on? Yeah. It's so funny because we dated like all through college. And then the day after Leah Thomas and I had raced, he proposed to me. Louis did. And so, of course, having no idea what in the world he was getting himself into at this point. Uh, and we got married pretty quickly after two months or so later. And so it's been almost two years. He has now, of course, working in construction where they don't understand the Queen's English. Um, his accent is so funny. I was going to ask you, are there funny cultural things that he does or says that make 100%. you laugh? hundred percent. He still says rubbish when talking about trash, which is... Like take the rubbish wrong. out. Like that is that feels criminal. <laughs> so his accent is hilarious. It's like this like country British accent. People ask him, people ask him all the time, and they're like, where are you from? They can't even tell anymore. So he's the best. He gets to travel with me some, which is wonderful, uh, when and where he can. Um, which is, is it hard on him seeing the amount of hate that you get and when you're being held hostage in schools and all that? Definitely. I think for any, you know, man, like an actual man, like, I mean, you know, my dad, my husband, two men in my life who love me, care for me, want to protect and provide for me, right? Like it was really hard for both of these men to kind of see and continue to see like the vitriol 
uh, that our side is up against, specifically, you know, social media, different things. Of course, they read these comments and uh, my husband oftentimes wants to just clap back and say something. And I'm like, just don't, it's not worth it. But he's, he's incredibly supportive. He's um, my rock. It's so nice having a constant through the ups and downs of everything, um, which is, is the biggest blessing. So I'm very, very lucky. I really am. So when he's weathering these storms, I know there was a, a calendar that you were asked to pose in and it was marketed towards conservative dads and you were in a one-piece bathing suit. I mean, when people got up in arms about that on the right, were you caught off guard by that? Was he caught off guard by that? Totally. So my perspective going into this, um, the proceeds, some of the proceeds went back to my foundation, which ultimately is, of course, dedicated to saving women's sports. So I thought that was wonderful. Given the fact that I'm a swimmer, it wasn't a big deal for me or my husband. I mean, this isn't, I mean, the men were like little tiny Speedos all the time. And like, <laughs> it, it just wasn't a big deal to me. We've been so desensitized to to like this half nudity thing because we've done it our whole lives. And so it wasn't a big deal to me or him, honestly. But I, what I will say now having, you know, looking back and and kind of removing myself from the situation, removing myself from kind of getting caught up in in the naivety and just saying yes to something that I thought would be relatively harmless. Innocuous. Yeah. Um, I will say that I don't think that's the best representation of me. You know, try in this appeal to dads, that's that's not a good representation of me. Again, I don't think it was the way people got up in arms, I think is a bit silly. Um, I do think it was you know, just, it didn't need to be the coverage and everything that it got. But I will say it's not something that I think is a good representation of me. If you knew then what you know now, you would not have agreed to participate. I mean, virtually every other influencer in the calendar who are wonderful people, who are people I like and respect and love and talk with often and, and think they're wonderful, wonderful people. They were all defending their positions. I never, I never defended this because again, ultimately this was something that I didn't want to defend for well, myself. I think that says a lot about your character too, is that you, yeah, you didn't defend it. You were like, you know what? You're right. I don't like the optics of this. I probably wouldn't choose to do this again. And and I yeah. think that's great. And you moved on. Does it feel like sometimes you just can't win? Because I feel like this sometimes, I mean, I will get, you know, obviously we get hate from the left, but then there are days where we do something that we just, we don't even think twice about. And then it upsets people on the right. And it's like, oh my gosh, like sometimes I just am like, I'm not good enough for anybody. The left hates me because I'm too conservative. The right hates me because, you know, allegedly I'm not conservative enough. And it's like, where do I even find a place to stand in this movement? Some days I just want to throw the towel. Like, do you do you feel that like I do? Some of the worst hate I've ever gotten is from people on the right. Same, same. When I started, when I just decided to leave, I was in pop radio for almost a decade doing morning shows. And when I decided to come over to Turning Point USA, I had this idea just watching like, like how Charlie Kirk deals with, you know, leftist haters on college campuses at Candace Owens, because those were the t- the people right. who were big in the media at the time. I was like thinking the only hate I was ever going to get was going to be from the left. And actually, I hardly ever get hate from the left. I always get criticisms from the right. Totally. Yeah. It was actually a conservative influencer who leaked my address, my home address, uh, to which I had people showing up at my house. For what reason? Because I said something in support of Ron DeSantis. I don't think these have to be mutually exclusive. I can think they're both good I'm the and same would way. be good options. I think Ron DeSantis is, of course, what he's done in Florida is amazing. I think he is someone who has served this country, which I have great respect and admiration for. He is someone who I believe is a a strong Christian. Um, he's a wonderful leader. He's that a wonderful husband, family man. but. You were doxxed by a conservative. Yeah. Like, and I'm talking like that, that camp uh, was so angry for even remotely praising DeSantis. We we face vitriol on all sides. Yeah. I think that's important for people to know, too. We deal with it. We deal with a lot as public figures in this space. Okay. So I was talking to you a little bit off camera when we showed up and I was like, I have to ask you on camera. Okay. So I am so into the health and wellness stuff right now, like, and mainly food. I would say I'm, I'm really interested in learning about corruption in our food system in America. But I'm really curious because you are an athlete. Obviously, fitness matters to you. But I was curious, like, are 
are you also in this like organic, no seed oils ever train that is becoming popular? Or are you like, I don't know anything about that. I just like going to the gym. (laughs) I think that we would complement each other well because (laughs) in terms of all the health side of things from, from the perspective of food and what I'm putting in my body, what I will say is when I was swimming, I mean, we swam six hours every single day. We swam upwards of 15,000 yards a day, which is equivalent to about 10 miles every single day. So that being said, I could eat whatever I wanted. I actually needed to eat bad food to be able to maintain, and you're burning 5,000, 6,000 calories every single day. So I, I had to eat bad And I grew to love eating bad. (laughs) And so my diet now, I'm not proud of my diet. But what's what's your diet? Like, let's just say on average, you wake up in the morning, like, do you even eat breakfast? Like, what does a realistic day of food look like for you? It's changed a little in the way that I don't eat as much, um, but I still eat bad food. So love sweets. There's a crumble cookie box back here. Don't know if the cameras can see it. Uh, I go to crumble multiple times a week. Oh no, right. I gotta get you. I, I'm gonna awaken you to the problems with crumble, but oh, go no. on. Oh no, I'm I gonna really ruin that need for you. to be. I know, I know. Ignorance is bliss. Don't even tell me. If I if I don't know it, it's not true. Um I eat fast food a lot. I'm okay. a terrible cook. I am really I, oh terrible. It's a, it's so sad. My husband, he he's the He's the cook. No, does he, he can cook, but does he, or do you guys usually just go out to eat? We go out to eat. Okay. A lot. Mostly like every night? Uh, well, I'm on the road so much too. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, nine times out of 10, I'm eating out. I'm eating at a restaurant or a lot of times fast food. Now, do you work out every day? That's where that You're better is than what, me. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, that's what I love to do. I love working out. I love, I run, I do marathons, I do triathlons, I do... I'm swimming Alcatraz actually next this month actually and so oh my gosh so I, I love I love competing to be honest with you I love winning I hate losing um I work out every single morning that I'm home at least uh with my mom and my dad my younger sister my older sister and my grandma the whole family comes whole over family. to work out at your house we go to a gym and we do it every single morning my family uh did it this morning actually and so uh, that's something that I value so much. Um, and so all of those things, again, running multiple times a week, I, I love the fitness side of things from, from, I guess the, the activity standpoint, love it. Okay. So I just literally am clueless on like, I don't even know how to do a squat. I'm dead serious. I've been blessed with, I I don't, I, I'm naturally thin, but I um, am so weak. Like my, my muscles are mush. So like for somebody who's like, okay, well, I want to be like you, Riley. I want to have this motivation to get up and go to the gym every day. And I mean, I don't know. Do you have any tips or uh, recommendations for workouts or? Well, I think strength workouts so like lifting even if it's not heavy i think it's so important and it's it's in terms of what i have seen for myself and being toned and being lean and different things i could do cardio all day long but if i'm not lifting i i don't feel i don't look as good to be honest with you and so see i've been wondering like cuz people talk about how women need to be lifting weights a little bit i cuz i definitely i don't want to be like a bodybuilder or right. anything i don't i don't desire that look but they still say it's super important to do that or i've been toying with the idea of pilates because like everybody's oh, yeah. talking about pilates so like what are your thoughts on that no i think pilates is wonderful it's okay. a way to like define those little muscles that you don't even really know that you have yes so totally pilates we go to a gym called f45 which is kind of like hit training, which I love. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's something that everyone should do. Man, woman, everyone should do it. Um, it just makes you feel better. It's such a good stress reliever. It's for, at least for me, it's such a good outlet like where, and you know, this. so much of what we deal with on a day-to-day basis in terms of the hate. I mean, just the busy schedule of it all, the toll that it takes on you, the, both the positive and the negative, like I need an outlet mm-hmm. for that. Um, and that outlet for me is working out. And so So besides working out, let's say you have a true day off where you are home and you have zero work obligations. What is your dream day? Are you literally not leaving your bed? Are you running errands? So I am very much an outdoorsy girl. Okay. Big time into hunting, fishing. I've got a horse. I've got lots of dogs, different things. And so I love that life. 
I really do. I have a shooting range at the back of my property. And so uh, that's something that my husband and I, um, again, so funny, him being from England, having, they don't have guns over there. And so when he came over to the States, like this is this newfound passion for him. Uh, and so we love that kind of thing. We love spending our time outside. Um, again, riding my horse. I get in these Facebook groups, right? And <laughs> I know. It's like a grandma thing. No, we get in these I, Facebook I, groups. We have a Facebook group, the Cute Servatives Facebook group for my audience. And that is the only, if I go on Facebook, that is the only thing I see and the only thing I'm in. I don't venture anywhere no, else. No, And that's, that. my like page is tailored to these like animal rescue pages. And I'm like, I don't need to see these because I will actually rescue every single animal. <laughs> and so I saw this horse on there not too long ago and it was um, this older horse. He's in his, eight, I mean, he's 18 years old. Uh, he had, hadn't been let out of his stall in months. Aww. And so his, his hooves were bruised and he had arthritis and all kinds of different things. And so I saw him and I'm like, I actually have to get him. I have to. It's, what was his name? Uh, his name at the time was Splash, but I named him Cowboy. Cute. I changed his name. In the few weeks before I got him, there was three University of Wyoming swimmers who actually died in a car accident. Um, and of course, their mascot is the Cowboys. And so I thought I'm going to name him Cowboy in Aww. memory of, of these swimmers who passed away. And so but he's a wonderful, wonderful horse. He has improved so much. He's getting so much better. But all that to say, these Facebook groups are dangerous. I know they're addicting. That's honestly the only good thing about Facebook at this point, I feel. So would you say that you're like a, a pretty low maintenance girly when it comes to like a beauty routine or high maintenance? I am, I'm just about as low maintenance as you can get to be, to be totally honest with you. Uh, I think back to like my wedding day, I ordered my dress online for $40. <gasps> I'm like, just, I don't even care what it looks like. Came in like the day before I'm good. I had my friend do my hair and makeup. I had my grandma's neighbor make our cake. Uh, one of my high school teachers took our photos. I'm like, nah, I'm easy. Um, those kinds of things just don't, it's just not important to me. Okay. So now though, are you get trying to get more into that because you are on camera so much and you're like, okay, I really need to be thinking about like my skin and things like that. Yes. Because again, never something I cared about before, never a career or a path that I wanted to go down where I had to sit in front of a camera. And so when I first started doing media or whatever, I would, I would just look like me. I'm wearing athletic clothes. I've got my hair back. I like don't have makeup on. It never bothered me. But then I'm like looking back, I'm like, mm, something's different about me <laughs> and everyone else. Maybe I should try harder and like actually put in the effort and and try to understand. Cause again, so so much of my life, you wake up in the morning, you go get in a cold pool, your hair's wet all day. You have to come back that afternoon, practice again. I mean, my hair was wet for like essentially four years straight. I don't think it ever dried. And so like, I just, I never wore makeup. I never wore nice clothes because we never went out because anytime we had off from the pool, we were sleeping or like at home doing nothing because we loved doing that. So I'm new to this space, I feel like, all that to say. And so I am trying to learn. I am trying to prioritize, you know, my hair health and my skin health and and understanding and, and learning things that, you know, in products, um, skincare products and lines like Nimi, that has been foundational for me. Uh, really, these are the only products actually that I use. I was the kind of girly, and I'm still working on it, who would sleep in my makeup from the night before, wake up the next day, and I was like, oh, my makeup's oh, already done. This a cardinal is sin, Riley. I know. A cardinal sin. I'll never allow you to do that while you're with me. <laughs> um, so funny about Nimi. I love that you're using Nimi now because I've been talking about them for years. So when they very, very first started, they sent me this package in the mail and they were like, hey, Alex, we're this new conservative Christian skincare company. We're just starting out. Absolutely zero pressure to post any of this or anything. We are genuinely looking for real feedback on the products. Do you like it? Is there something that we could prove? Do you hate it? And I was like, Ugh. I get, I mean, I'm sure you do too. We get stuff sent to us all the time and especially makeup and skincare. I mean, majority of the time, I'm like, I could do without this. Like, this does nothing for me. I tried that hydrating moisturizer from Nimi. I emailed them immediately. I said, send me 75 of these. Like, Lifeline. I could not believe how good this moisturizer was. And it just, 
and you know, I'm somebody that like, I've tried everything. I've tried like the, the $39 Kiehl's cream. I've, I've tried, you know, $400 different creams from Saks, like trying to find the best moisturizer because my skin is so dry. I struggle with this. It's like, it just drinks everything up. And that was the first moisturizer where I felt like my skin was hydrated all day. 110%. And again, um, like you, my skin, uh, having been like exposed to chlorine for so long, which is like this toxic chemical. Yes. I, I don't know how that's even legal, really. Your skin has to be stripped. Oh, like stripped entirely. And so I have very dry, kind of rashy skin too. It has like really, and this is two years post-swimming, I still struggled with with having this skin that wouldn't ever heal fully, it, it seemed like. These like eczema looking patches, dry, red, has entirely, I mean, my skin is, is, it's wonderful now. So, so what is your full, like, if you were to do a nighttime skincare routine, I mean, Nimi products and, and other products also, just what all are you using in your nighttime routine right now? Really only using Nimi skincare products. And so I will use the vitamin C scrub or they have a, a gel cleansing um, scrub to get my makeup off. I'll do that. Wash my face. Um, they have an overnight uh, recovery mask. Yeah. It's love lavender. That. Yes. Yes. Love that. So I'll use that sometimes if my skin is like extra super dry. I'll use the hydrating cream. They have a peptide cream, which I use too um, for like the anti-aging wrinkles. I, I watch like TikTok tutorials about like what I need to do, what retinol even means. I'm like learning all this stuff now. Oh, retinol is a game changer. So that's something like mid to late 20s and then definitely me. I'm in my early 30s. But like girlies, you got to have the retinol. Come on. That is that is the number one thing. If I could tell everybody, like, this is the one thing you have to include in your routine. It's got to be retinol and something. Okay. Yeah. I think I need to hear yours. Okay. Give me a tutorial. Mine would overwhelm you, though, because, see, this is the thing is that you're, like, more low maintenance and you're just getting started. But I'm so, learning. Okay. Well, I use, like, a hundred different things. Okay. Actually, first, tell me how long it takes you. I need to know that first. Oh, that is such a good question. I think it probably is about all, everything I'm doing, I think it's probably a good half hour. Oh, my gosh. Alex. <laughs> Half so hour. The first thing we're okay. doing is we're getting a we're getting it. And by the way, they're not sponsors. I'm just telling you what I'm using. Is I get a um, full glass of ice. I I fill it halfway with lemon lime olipop, and then I put a little bit of organic 100% tart cherry juice in there. Um, and then I have this magnesium powder. Magnesium is so good for relaxing your body and helping you get a good night's sleep. Stir that up, and I'm drinking that as I'm starting my routine. Oh my I'm, gosh. I'm, take, okay. I'm taking a micellar water and I'm using that to get all of my makeup off first. Then I take a. With what? Do you use like a washcloth? Um, I use organic cotton rounds. Okay. Yeah. And you want organic because organic cotton is not going to be sprayed with glyphosate, which is terrible. Okay. Cancer causing. Okay. You don't want that. So get, get organic cotton rounds. You can get it at Whole Foods. You can order it on Amazon. Okay. Okay. So I'm taking my makeup off and I'm using a oil to to do an oil cleanse. Then I'm using my Nimi. I like the vitamin C cleanser also twice. So if you have makeup on, you got to cleanse two times to Gosh. truly get it all off after you've removed it with the micellar water. I'm See, I told you, I told you this okay, is going to overwhelm going, you. Keep going. So then I cleanse twice. Then I do a serum routine. Uh, so Nimi has a fantastic vitamin C serum yeah. and hyaluronic acid. Those two together, it's like plastic surgery in a bottle, basically. You use those two together always, morning and night. So I do both of those. And the key is you want to wait 45 seconds in between each application to really get the benefits of each product. Okay. So I do the vitamin C serum, okay. wait 45 seconds, take a sip of my Olipop. Then I'm doing my hyaluronic acid. Then I do a little eye cream pat. And you always use your ring finger for eye cream to delicately put that on because that area is so sensitive. You don't want to pull hard because that can really damage your skin. So you want to, you want to pat and also do on your eyelid because of the wrinkles on your eyelid. People forget about the eyelid. And oh my then, gosh. I'm like in awe. Kind I know. Of. And then you do the um, Nimi. I do the hydrating cream. So the thing is, is that they say like, because it has retinol in it, that that is supposed to be for nighttime. Um, don't tell Nimi, but I'm like, I tell people use that morning and night. Like, I'm telling. The thing is, I have a- I'm, I'm telling Nimi. <laughs> I have a full like make, I have a full makeup routine on every day because I film every day. So like, would I lay? Would I put only moisturizer on and walk outside in Phoenix sun? No, but because I'm putting makeup and stuff on on top of it, I'm not worried about burning because you're more sensitive to sunburn. 
If you have if you have retinol, well, not moisturizer. You want moisturizer okay. during the day, but just the retinol in the Nimi okay. hydrating cream can make you more susceptible to burn. But I'm a rebel, and I'm not worried about that. Oh, rule breaker! So, I know. So then, the last thing is, once I have all that skincare on my face, then I have. I love the which they need. I would die for them to be a sponsor, but they're not. The Earthly Wellness Good Night Lotion also has magnesium. Okay. When you and your husband get on the magnesium lotion train. This penetrates your skin, gets into your body, and you just have the best sleep of your freaking life. I'm it is so good for babies. Intrigued. Oh my gosh. Put it on your put it on your toddler who like is struggling falling asleep. Your kids are antsy because they've been, you know, had a busy day. Put that magnesium lotion on. It's such a game changer. Everyone has to use it. I got it for my friend who is pregnant. And during her pregnancy, she struggled with restless leg. She's like, oh my gosh, my body's finally relaxed. Just it's one of my most favorite, like wellness products ever. What was the brand again? Earthly, Earthly? Wellness. And it's okay. non-toxic, organic, and they have this magnesium. It's called the Good Night Lotion. But it's real stuff. Wow. It like really puts magnesium. It's such a good... So I'm a big magnesium person. Um, and depending on what's going on with my body, if I'm having trouble pooping, I'm taking magnesium citrate. Because right. there's like a hundred different versions of magnesium. Oh my gosh, my mind. If they're, if you're just str struggling with sleep, then I'm taking magnesium glycinate. Is that what it is? Anyway, you will learn. But see, I told you it would overwhelm. So like I am, what I love is that like if you are the low maintenance person who is starting a skincare routine for the first time, starting your wellness routine, Riley is the perfect person <laughs> because you've got like a couple things you're like, I'm getting started. This is what I'm using. Right. And then if you're like experienced, like so for me, I'm like, I want the longest routine ever. I want to use all the products. I want to take all the supplements. I'll take a Epsom salt bath. I'm doing all these things like because I'm so into this. So if you want the advanced version, then you can do my routine. And if you want the simple version, then you're Riley. You're so funny. Well, your skin, I mean, you, it's working. Thank so you. now well, I'm- you look good too. Oh, stop it. Now I'm- I'm, I might have to carve out an extra 30 minutes in my my nighttime routine now. I know. And then, you know, what I do if I am wanting to be really, um, if I'm really wanting to go for the gold. Okay. That's a, I like that. Yes, I yes. like that. Then, I, then I'll then i read, you know, you you I put my phone on airplane mode. Also, never ever sleep with your phone by your bed with your Wi-Fi on. You want your Wi-Fi fully turned off. Oh my gosh, Alex. I know. And then I'm reading. And speaking of reading, you've got a new book. Look at that segue. <laughs> Guys, this is why they pay me. This is why they pay me <laughs> to do this. gets the big bucks. You have a brand new book, Swimming Against the Current, Fighting for Common Sense in a World That's Lost Its Mind. The cover is stunning. So I'm like a book. I have a huge um, floor to ceiling. It takes up an entire wall in my living room bookshelf. And I love the bright blue of your book. It is so beautiful. It stands You're out. So sweet. Whenever I have an author on my show who has a pretty color, I always have to compliment that because not enough people do it. Everybody's Come doing on. black. Everybody does white. Um, there's, there's a lot of red books. There's not enough bright blue and there's not enough yellow or green. So, totally. Could not agree more. Yes. So tell and us about your book. Gosh, what a... What a crazy process it is to, I mean, to write a book, to be able to recount kind of, of course, I mean, there's very brief in there about my childhood and the lead up to ultimately that national championships. And, and of course, much more in depth about what we faced and the intimidation and, and the different um, factors that they use ultimately to to force us into submission. Talking about COVID in there, which there's a lot of parallels between mm. what we faced um, as collegiate athletes during COVID at the end of my sophomore year. Yeah, you had to swim with a mask on, didn't you? They certainly tried. Yeah, we like waterboarded ourselves every day. <laughs> it was ridiculous as if chlorine wasn't killing. It just insane. So, but there was, again, a lot of between the, the COVID stuff and the whole thing with with Leah Thomas, this, my senior year, there was so many parallels. So getting into that, of course, ultimately, how we got here, right? Um, from the the sporting perspective, right? The International Olympic Committee, the NCAA, the the Biden administration, and what they've done now, um, understanding those things, and and ultimately, like what we can do as everyday people, um, how we can combat this movement, how we can be effective, how we can uh, find our voices, be bold, be courageous, be strong, uh, be fearless. So. All of those things again, really fun. I got to even record the audio book. Oh, which, good! No, no one told me how hard yeah. it was to record your own 
book. So does somebody stand there? How does that work? Does somebody stand there and say, like, you need to say that sentence again? It fell flat or yeah. what? Yeah. There's like a studio producer type person. I don't know his, his title, but yeah, there. it's like, I mean, you think of like a recording studio for like a music artist and that's that's where you are. And so a similar setup to this, right? A microphone, you have headphones on. You just read. The days were so long. Like I, How many hour, days does it take to read a it book? It took me like three, six hour days ridiculous it should not have taken me that long but by the end of like hour five uh, m my brain is mush yeah. I couldn't even finish a sentence anymore I'm like no like you guys I actually I would have to redo it probably took me 15 minutes to read one page do they at want the end you to of stand day. does it sound better to read while you're standing or do you sit I was sat yeah I was okay. sat but I read it of course the pdf file on like an ipad and so by the end of it my eyes Ugh. oh like I was mush I was mush I always wonder how that works so that's so interesting and I'm assuming um you can get swimming against the current anywhere books are sold amazon correct Correct. Cool. And then where can people follow you on social media? Gosh, you can find me on X at Riley underscore Gaines underscore. Uh, my Instagram is Riley G. Barker. Uh, Barker is my my actual married last name. Uh, I got married at such a time where it was like w hard almost to like switch my my last name from what I had started to be relatively known as. And so uh, it's nice to certainly have that alias, but that's Riley G. Barker. Uh, those are really the only platforms that I find myself using. Okay, cool. At least I'm not posting on Facebook. I'm strictly You're on just in Facebook horse for, the, for the animal rescue groups. <laughs> okay, we'll put all the links uh, in the show notes. Thank you so much, Riley, for hosting me in Tennessee and coming on the show. No, I'm thrilled. You're the best. Uh, I want to be just like you. So that is such a sweet compliment. No, I really do. So you inspire me with everything that you do. And to be able to sit down and talk with you is um, just an honor. So thank you. I was actually supposed to go horseback riding and do all kinds of fun things with Riley at a ranch. But when we were out there, everything was flooded due to a massive storm. So I just have an excuse to go back again sometime. Her new book is phenomenal. By the way, I could not put it down. Next week's episode has been a long time coming. It is the childhood vaccine schedule episode. Prepare your mind, body, and soul. Also, because we don't truly really have free speech anymore, this will be an audio-only episode. It will not be on YouTube. So get your notebook ready because you never know if it could get censored or taken down. That drops next Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it. Bye. Bye.